We are finally at our penultimate section in this course on multivariable calculus. This is the only video left in this particular playlist. Now, we've examined several versions of the fundamental theorem of calculus in higher dimensions, relating the integral around some kind of oriented boundary of a domain to some kind of derivative of that entity on the oriented domain. In this section, we're going to take a look at what's known as the divergence theorem. It's the final theorem of this type that we'll study. Now, the divergence theorem has many uses in physics. In particular, the divergence theorem is used in the field of partial differential equations to derive equations that model heat flow or conservation of mass. It is also used in electrostatic fields. Now, in our previous section, we took a look at Stokes' theorem. In Stokes' theorem, we were finding that the integral of a vector field on a surface could be related to a vector line integral around a simple closed curve. In other words, we wanted to evaluate the surface integral on a surface in a vector field, we could instead take the widest part of that surface and we could compute a vector line integral on the boundary, that curve that encircled it at the widest point instead. In this particular section, we're going to look at the divergence theorem. The divergence theorem also is going to be taking a look at the surface integral on a vector field. This time though, instead of relating it to a vector line integral around a simple closed curve, the curve which completely encases the surface, we will instead compare it to a triple integral of the enclosed solid inside the surface. We have a couple of learning objectives in this particular section. There is a third learning objective in the textbook, but we will not cover it in this video. This first objective is simply to explain the meaning of the divergence theorem. How can we interpret what we're saying? And the second one is to use the divergence theorem to calculate the flux of a vector field. Remember that the flux of a vector field is just another name for a surface integral on a vector field. Let me share my screen with you and we'll get started on the last video for this course. Before we just dive right in to the final penultimate theorem, the divergence theorem, Let's go ahead and give an overview of the different forms of the fundamental theorem of calculus. These different theorems that have related somehow the derivative of some entity to the value of an integral around the boundary of it. This includes the fundamental theorem of calculus that we studied in Calculus 1, the fundamental theorem of line integrals, Green's theorem, both flux and circulation forms, and Stokes' theorem that we learned in the last section. Let's take a look, first of all, at the fundamental theorem of calculus, in specific, part two. The fundamental theorem of calculus, part two, states if f prime is continuous over the closed interval, x equal a to x equal b, then the definite integral from x equal a to x equal b of f prime of x dx is equal to the value of the function on the boundary of that line segment on the x-axis, f at b minus f at a. Again, we're giving information about the derivative of f based on the value of the function value at the endpoints of what is essentially a straight line segment 
on the x-axis from A to B. We can think of that line segment as a kind of curve. So we're saying something about the derivative of f, knowing only what happens on the endpoints. Let's now take a look at the fundamental theorem for line integrals. The fundamental theorem for line integrals starts, of course, with a piecewise smooth curve. It can have corners, but we know that the end of one piece is the beginning of the next piece. Let's suppose that it has parameterization given by R of T, where T varies from A to B. That means that R of A gives us the initial point of this curve C, and R of B gives us the final point on the curve C. Then we allow F to be some function with first order partial derivatives that have to exist and must be continuous along the curve. If that's the case, then the gradient of that function f, del f, dotted with dr, the vector line integral differential, tells us that we can compute the value on the curve c by computing the value of the function f at r of b and subtracting from it the value of f at r of a. In other words, if we think of the gradient as a sort of derivative operator, we're saying something about the derivative of the function f on a curve c by knowing only something about the boundaries of the function at the endpoints. Now, in this case, of course, our path C does not have to be a line segment on the x-axis. It could be a path in the plane, or it could be a path in three-dimensional space. If we think of that in that form, then this also is sort of an analog or an extension of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Notice also that because this lowercase function f exists, del of f, or the gradient of f, means that in fact, we have a conservative vector field. Since the definition of a conservative vector field is one for which there exists a function whose gradient gives us the vector field. Let's now go ahead and take a look at Green's theorem. There are two forms of Green's theorem, circulation form and flux form. Let's look at the circulation form first. <coughs> there are many conditions to apply Green's theorem. I always think of it as a four, three, two. There are four conditions on the curve. The curve must be piecewise smooth. It must be simple. It cannot intersect itself. It must be closed. Where you start and stop has to be the same location. And we prefer it to be oriented counterclockwise since we chose that arbitrarily to be the positive direction. Those are our four conditions on the curve. And we have three conditions on the region inside of the curve. The region D, which is encircled by our curve C, has to be open, not including the boundary C. It has to be simply connected, simple and connected and open. Simple for a two-dimensional, since Green's theorem only applies to two-dimensional vector fields. In this case, when we have this, it means that there's no hole inside the region. If I have D as some region in the plane, then there's no hole. Connected means I can walk from any point inside of D to any other point inside of D. That gives me my three conditions on the region, and I have two conditions on the vector field. The vector field has to have component functions, P and Q, that are continuous, and have partial derivatives on D, the region inside the closed curve C. If 
these four, three, two conditions are met, then we can say that the integral of f dot a unit tangent vector with the arc length differential around the closed curve C, which we often represent with a closed circle on a single integral, which we define to be f dot dr with a vector over it, where dr with a vector over it is the unit tangent vector multiplied by the arc length differential ds. This can be converted into a single integral on a parameter, where we have a parameterization given by r of t, where t varies from a to b giving us the single integral from t equal a to t equal b of the vector field at the parameterization f of r of t dotted with r prime of t, a tangent vector dt. We also found that this could be written in terms of p dx plus q dy, again, on the closed curve. This line integral, however, by Green's theorem, becomes the value of a double integral over the parameter domain. When we look at this, this integral over D, which is the region inside of the curve, is the same as the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y integrated with respect to the area differential. Now the partial of Q with respect to X and the partial of P with respect to Y are cross partials. If we have a conservative vector field, these are equal to one another, which must mean that if we have a conservative vector field, this becomes zero, which of course tells us that the circulation is going to be zero. Now, this is sometimes indicated with an arrow along the curve in the integral. When that is the case, then it simply is pointing out that the curve does have an orientation, that counterclockwise is positive. And if you wanna go clockwise, you simply multiply it by a negative one. Now, let's suppose that we Think about the evaluation of the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y. If it's not a conservative vector field, it doesn't have the cross partial, then, well, assuming it doesn't have the cross partial, it's possible to not be conservative and still have the property. But supposing it doesn't, then this difference of the cross partials is equal to the curl of the vector field dotted with the k vector. Now remember, Green's theorem only applies in the xy plane. In that case, the normal vector is pointing in the direction of k. Since the curl is a sort of derivative del cross the vector field, then we can write that the line integral, vector line integral around a closed curve C of f dot dr with the vector over the r has to be given by the double integral over d, where d is the region inside of C, of the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y, which assuming it does not have the cross partial property, is the same as the curl of the vector field dotted with k. In this case, because the curl of the vector field, since it's in the plane, is going to have the k vector on it, k dot k just gives us a one. So in a sense, we can think of the circulation form as relating the integral of a kind of derivative of the curl of f, which is del cross f, over some plane region d to the integral of the vector field over the boundary of d, which is c. Let's go ahead and draw a region now so that we can see our region. c is the curve. d, on the other hand, would be 
what is inside. In this case, D is the solid space, the area inside of the curve, not including the curve, but the region trapped inside. And again, we are relating a vector line integral around the outside of D to a double integral over the inside of D. Let's now look at the flux form for Green's theorem. We again have our four, three, two requirements. The curve must be piecewise smooth, simple, closed, oriented counterclockwise. Inside of that curve is our region D. And that region D has to be open. It doesn't include the boundary. It has to be simply connected, meaning simple, no hole inside of it, and connected. I can walk from any point inside D to any other point inside D without leaving the red zone. If it's not simple, there is a hole, a white spot inside of the red. Then it would not be simple and I cannot use Green's theorem. Now I've got my four and my three. I need to have the two conditions on my vector field. The vector field, since again, we're in two dimensional space where Green's theorem applies, the vector field has two components, P and Q. P and Q have to be continuous over the open region containing D, and they have to have partial derivatives that exist over D. If that's the case, then the vector line integral on that closed loop of f dotted with the unit normal vector multiplied by the arc length differential ds can be re-represented again with a single integral of the parameterization of the curve, f of r of t dotted with a normal vector, which we usually do y prime of x comma negative x prime of, or what did I say, y prime of x? y prime of t comma negative x prime of t, where x of t, y of t is the parameterization. This will give us the integral from a to b, from t equal a to t equal b. However, we can also consider this to be the vector line integral of the opposite of q dx plus p dy, and we can then rewrite this, a la Green's theorem, as a double integral over the region inside the curve that red shaded regions D with the partial with respect to X of P plus the partial with respect to Y of Q. Now you will remember from 6.5 that that's the definition of divergence. And this gives us another way of representing this relationship. This tells us that the vector line integral of f dot a normal vector ds is the same thing on the curve C, is the same thing as the double integral on the inside of that curve of the divergence of f with respect to the area differential. So again, we're relating a sort of derivative of the vector field, in this case, divergence of the vector field, which is del dot f, not cross, cross would be for curl, the two c's together, um, divergence dot, keep the two d's together. In this case, it relates that derivative of sorts over the plane region, and by plane, they mean in the flat x, y plane, d, to a vector line integral of the vector field f around the boundary of d, which is the curve c. Then we took a look at Stokes' theorem. 
Stokes' theorem is what we covered in the previous section. Stokes' theorem started with a surface, a sort of two-dimensional object that nonetheless exists in three-dimensional space. We can think of it as maybe my hyperbolic paraboloid that you see here. At any one point, it has length and width, but it has no height or depth to it. It is two-dimensional, but it exists here in our three-dimensional space. We can also envision it as sort of a sheet blowing in the wind. If we start with something that it's least piecewise smooth, and remember that we can even take something like a Kleenex box, which is piecewise smooth. It does have eight corners where it's not smooth. And it does have, well, what would that be? Four, four, and four, 12 edges where it's not smooth. But it is smooth in pieces. I have six smooth pieces, the top, the bottom, and the four lateral sides then as long as it's piecewise smooth and it has an orientation with a boundary around it that is simple, not intersecting itself, closed, and piecewise smooth curve C with a positive orientation. If we're looking at this right here, I can simply go around it with a square. It is piecewise smooth, simple, closed, and I can orient it counterclockwise. If I've met all those conditions, I can let F be a vector field, and it's going to have component functions that again have to meet my conditions. They have to be continuous on some open region which includes my surface, and they have to have partial derivatives. All of that is the case, then I can relate the circulation f dot dr around the curve c to the surface integral of the curl of the vector field dotted with the surface integral differential. In other words, I can take instead a normal vector if I've parameterized it in terms of r of u and v, a normal vector would be r sub u cross r sub v, the two directional derivatives, the partial of r with respect to u and the partial of r with respect to v. If I take the curl of f, which is itself a vector field, and I dot it with this normal vector, and I evaluate it over the surface, then I can, in fact, find the value of f dot dr. Stokes's theorem relates the integral of the derivative of sorts, where the derivative is the curl, c for cross. So it's del cross f over some surface s, which may not, probably not, exists in the plane. It's probably something that exists in three-dimensional space to an integral of the vector field over the boundary of that, which is the closed curve C. We're finally ready to do our penultimate uh, definition, which extends the fundamental theorem of calculus into yet one higher dimension. In this case, what we want to do is we want to set our conditions as we've been doing all along. And instead of relating the surface integral of a vector field, f dot ds, to a line integral around the widest part of that surface, we're instead going to relate it to a triple integral over the solid contained inside of the surface. So it will have to be a closed surface. And when we evaluate the triple integral, the integrand will be the divergence of the vector field with respect to the volume differential. What are the conditions in order for this to be true? I need the surface to be piecewise smooth and 
closed. This is not closed. If I ignore the handle of this, well, ice bucket, it is closed. Remember that on a closed surface, we consider the positive orientation to be out no matter which direction that points. It encloses a solid. You can think of this surface sort of like a balloon. When you blow the balloon up, then the balloon itself, that latex, is forming the surface. If you fill the balloon with concrete and let it set, and then you peeled off the latex covering, that lump of concrete would represent the solid enclosed by the surface S. We're gonna call that solid E. We're going to assume that the surface is oriented outward, which is the positive direction for a closed surface. We again have our two conditions on the vector field. Its components are continuous and there are partial derivatives, which are continuous. It must be defined on an open region containing that entire solid. That's the case, then I can compute the flux of the surface, which is the surface integral of the vector field, by instead computing a triple integral on the divergence of the vector field. Now, how is the divergence theorem similar to the theorems that have preceded it? We are again evaluating a triple integral of a derivative of a kind, where the derivative is the divergence of the vector field, del dot f. And we're relating it over some solid, and here the solid is shaded in blue, to a flux integral, a surface integral on a vector field over the boundary of the solid, which is the outer casing of that solid, the surface S. In this sense, we have now looked at multiple versions of the fundamental theorem of calculus, pulling it from one dimension to another. We can think of the divergence theorem as a form of Green's theorem, the flux form. Green's theorem flux form states that if we have a closed curve, then f dot a unit normal vector ds is given by the double integral over d of the divergence of f with respect to the area differential. So we've taken something over a curve in the plane, which is essentially a one-dimensional object. Curves have length, but no width or depth or height, and related it to something in two dimensions, the double integral over the inside of the curve of the divergence of the vector field. Now we have the divergence theorem which takes the surface integral of a vector field where the surface is essentially a two-dimensional object existing in three-dimensional space, the outer skin, if you will, and relates it to a triple integral of the divergence of F over the solid inside the skin. So we've gone from one dimension on the curve to two dimensions on the double integral, from two dimensions on the surface to three dimensions of the solid inside of the surface. Now, proving this theorem is beyond the scope of this course, but we can justify it and give a sort of informal proof. We're going to start by meeting our conditions to let S be some piecewise smooth, closed surface. This will not work. This is not closed. If I look at the Kleenex box, the cardboard that makes up the box is the surface. If I filled it with concrete and let it set, that concrete would be the solid on the inside. 
we would call that solid uppercase letter E. We're going to assume that S has the positive orientation, which is out of this shape. We're going to let our vector field be given in terms of the components P, Q, and R. The vector field must have continuous partial derivatives. P, Q, and R must be continuous. They must have partial derivatives, and the partial derivatives are continuous. It has to be defined on an open region, which completely encloses that solid E. As long as we have that, then we're going to take a partition. After all, it's the calculus thing to do. When we take a partition, what we're talking about is taking some solid and slicing it up. In this case, we're going to slice it up with knives that are cutting parallel to one of the coordinate planes, the XY plane, the XZ plane, and the YZ plane. In that case, we get a whole bunch of boxes, sort of like a Rubik's cube, which somehow build this three-dimensional solid, E. If we look at one particular box, B, inside of the solid, just pluck one out at random, then what can we say about that box? Our side links on the box are going to be delta x along the x axis parallel to the x, delta y parallel to the y axis, and delta z parallel to the z axis. In this way, we can also see that we have the k vector coming out of the top and negative k coming out of the bottom parallel to the z axis. In terms of x, I've also got i hat coming out to the right and negative i hat coming out to the left. In terms of the y direction, I've got j hat coming out of the page and negative j hat going into the page. So I can align the unit vectors, the standard basis vectors, with an edge of the box. I can also take a cut of the box in the dead center of the box. Now, when you're talking about the center of the box, you're not talking about the center of one side. You're talking about reaching your hand inside and finding that point that is the midpoint with respect to x, y, and z. When you do that, you can call that point x, y, z for the midpoint of the box. Now, we could take any point within the box, but for our purposes, it will be easier to take the midpoint. If we take that point in the center and we want to consider what's happening along the vector parallel to the z axis, then we know that from the center to the top, since the entire height is given by delta z, half the height is given by delta z divided by two. So the location of the center of the top, which would be here, right here, is going to be given by x comma y comma z plus delta z divided by two. The location of the center of the bottom of the Kleenex box is going to be given by x comma y comma z minus delta z divided by two. In this way, we can locate the midpoint on all six sides of that box. Now, how can we represent the change in the surface along each side? If we're looking at one particular side of the box, the surface on this edge is going to be given by delta x times delta y. The z does not change because z is constant on this side of the box, where the top has the k vector pointing straight up. So if I'm looking at the top side, I can think of the change in the surface, delta s, 
as delta x times delta y. It's parallel to the xy plane, and z does not vary. Let's think now about what the flux represents. The flux is like the net flow of some fluid over or through the surface. In this case, through the box. If we're doing that, remember that flow in is negative and flow out is positive. What is the flow through the box B? What would the flow through the Kleenex box be? Let's start by looking only in the direction that's vertical, aligned with k hat or negative k hat. If we restrict our view at first to just the vertical direction, then we know that we want to compute the dot product of the vector field with a normal vector. But a normal vector would be k hat. So if we dot F, which is P, Q, R, with K, which is 0, 0, 1, then we'll get R if we dot it with K hat and negative R if we dot it with negative K hat. In this way, we can think of the flux coming out of the top of the box as being approximated by R at the value of the center point of the top of the box, x, y, z plus delta z over two at that point times delta x, delta y. Then we can think of the flux out of the bottom of the box being approximated by negative r at the center of the bottom at that one point multiplied by delta x, delta y. Now to find the net flow in the vertical direction, I need to find the difference between the flow out and the flow in. Flow in is negative, flow out is positive. If I call that value, flow out minus flow in, delta r, then I can write the net flux in the vertical direction as delta r times delta x times delta y. Now we're going to apply a notational trick, an algebraic trick of multiplying by a form of one. Remember that the divergence theorem relates a surface integral of a vector field to a triple integral. That means that our differential has to be dv or dx, dy, dz and we don't yet have a dz or delta z. In order to introduce the delta z, we multiply by delta z divided by itself. Then we slide the parts of that unit fraction apart and multiply the numerator delta z by delta x and delta y. This gives us delta v, the differential for the volume. Then we take the delta z from the denominator and slide it under delta r. This gives us delta r delta z times delta v. We can think of delta r divided by delta z as approximating or being approximated by the partial of r with respect to z times delta v. Now remember that delta r and delta z, delta r is on the actual function itself, and the partial is on the approximation of it. But if we allow the size of the boxes to get smaller and smaller and smaller, delta r, delta z becomes arbitrarily close to the partial of r with respect to z. Now, I've done this just for the vertical direction, but I could do this in both the horizontal and the y direction. If I do those, then I'll get something very similar. I'll get the partial of component P with respect to X times delta V, the volume differential, and the partial of Q, component 2, with respect to Y, also multiplied by the volume differential. 
Now to find the net flux that is going through the surface, through this small box B, I need to add the flux out of the top minus in the bottom, out of the front minus in the back, and out of the, what would you call that, right side minus the part that comes in from the left. In order to do this, I need to add all three of the partials of the components multiplied by delta V. When I do that, I can factor out the delta V and I get the partial of P with respect to X plus the partial of Q with respect to Y plus the partial of R with respect to Z multiplied by delta V. However, the sum of these partials is the definition of the divergence of the vector field. That is del dot F. So now that we've got a representation for the net flow out of a single box, what happens when we put all of these boxes together? When I have 10 billion Kleenex boxes touching one another and creating the shape of my solid E. Let's take a look at just a small cluster of boxes that you see here on the right. This is one of the subsets of the boxes making up solid E. Now, when I think about what's happening with box B, what comes up out of box B is positive because it's flowing out of B. However, it goes directly into the bottom of box C. Because it goes into the box C, it must be negative. However, it's the same flow, which means the net flux at that point along that side is zero. Likewise, what flows out of the left side of A, out of A is positive, goes straight into D. Into D is negative. Because it's the same flow out of A and into D, the net flux across that surface is zero. When we look at it in this way, any touching sides of boxes will contribute nothing to the net flux over the entire surface of the solid E. The only sides of the boxes that contribute to the net flux are the ones that align with the surface. That's the surface S. All the interior sides end up with a net flux of zero since they come out of one box and go into another. So the only flux integrals that remain are the integrals over the faces approximating the boundary of the solid, which is the surface S. As the volumes of these approximating boxes shrink to zero, the approximation becomes arbitrarily close to the flux of the vector field over the surface S. That is, the divergence of the vector field evaluated in a triple integral over that solid region becomes equivalent to the flux of the vector field, the surface integral on the vector field F dot dx. Let's take a look at example one so you can see how to apply the divergence theorem. We have a vector field in three dimensions given by x plus y plus z, which is our p, y, which is our q, and 2x minus y, which is our r. The surface is given by a cylinder, x squared plus y squared equals one, which is a circle of radius one in the plane between z equals zero and z equal three. So we take the circle and we lift it three units, plus the circular top and the circular bottom of the cylinder. We want to assume that S is positively oriented. 
Since we have a cylinder, that means we're just going to point out of the cylinder, not towards the interior. We want to let E be the solid given by the cylinder with the top and the bottom included. Let's go ahead and take a look at this solid now. Here's my cylinder, circle radius one in the plane, drawn up parallel to the z-axis from zero to three. I've also plotted the vector field in this particular case. Let's now go ahead and apply the divergence theorem. We want to do it in both orientations. So we want to compute the triple integral and we want to compute the surface integral of the vector field. We're going to compute both and show that they're equivalent. Let's start with the triple integral side. We want to compute the divergence of F, which means we have to identify P, Q, and R. Take the partial of P with respect to X, plus the partial of Q with respect to Y, plus the partial of R with respect to Z. We want to set that to be the integrand in a triple integral over that cylinder. Let's go ahead and pause the video while you compute the divergence of V and try to integrate over this cylinder. In this case, we want to go ahead and find the partials of P, Q, and R. P again is given by X plus Y plus Z, so the partial of P with respect to Q is one. Q is Y, so the partial of Q with respect to Y is also one, which you add to the other. R is two X minus Y, which doesn't have a Z in it, so the partial of R with respect to Z is zero, giving me a divergence of the vector field of the number two. This is a measure of the flow out. Then I'm going to use the two as the integrand of a triple integral over the cylinder, which has radius one and goes from z equals zero to z equal three. Because it's a cylinder, it makes sense to use cylindrical coordinates. In this case, r varies from zero to one theta from zero to two pi, and z from zero to three. When you integrate, you can choose which of these to do first, since they're all constants. Don't forget that in cylindrical coordinates, your differential is r dr d theta. I chose to integrate with respect to z first, giving me two r z to evaluate from z equals zero to z equal three. This gave me 6R for the integral on the middle integral. 6R dr d theta from R equals 0 to 1, theta from 0 to 2 pi. When I integrate with respect to R, I get 6R squared over 2, or 3R squared. Evaluated from 0 to 1 gives me 3 for the final integram when I integrate with respect to theta. That gives me three theta evaluated from zero to two pi gives me six pi. Now you could also have noted up here that the two is a constant. And that means that you are integrating an integrand of positive one with respect to the volume differential. But my solid is a cylinder and it's a regular cylinder which means that I can compute its volume by taking the area of the base, the circle of radius r, pi r squared or pi one squared, which equals pi, and multiplying by the height, which is three. Then I take the three and multiply by the two, and I could have gotten six pi directly. So when we take this, we've got two different methods of coming up with the same value. In other words, the flux of this vector field is six pi. 
Let's now go ahead and use method two, where we're going to take a surface integral of the vector field, also called the flux integral. Again, we have to assume we have a continuous vector field with a domain that contains the oriented piecewise smooth surface S with unit no normal vectors N. And the surface integral is given by the formula that you see here if we use the normal um, parameterization x comma y comma z written as a function of x and y. Or we can parameterize in terms of r of u and v. Then we will evaluate the surface integral by converting it into a double integral on the parameter domain of f of r of u and v dotted with a normal vector r sub u cross r sub v. We know that f is continuous since its components are polynomials, and that means that we also have the partials. The cylinder is in fact piecewise smooth, but where the top and the bottom meet the lateral sides, we've got edges. So we've got a top surface, which is the circle of radius one, a bottom surface, which is the circle of radius one, and we've got the sides. Because the top and the bottom are so similar, we're going to work those two together. Let's go ahead and parameterize the top and the bottom. Since they're circles, we probably would want to use the cosine u sine u version. We know that the radius is going to stay one to give us the lateral sides. However, to get the entire top and the entire bottom, we're going to have to vary r from zero out to one, meaning that on the top and the bottom, the radius is not constant. When we look at it then, we can represent the top and the bottom in terms of u and v as u cosine v, u sine v, the value at the bottom would be zero in the z direction. Go ahead and write down what the parameterization of the top would be. We've now written a parameterization for both the top and the bottom, where the bottom is presented in blue and the top is presented in red. When we're looking at these two, notice that they are extremely similar. This is why we're doing them together. The bottom is u cosine v, u sine v, zero, where u varies from zero to one so that we can get the entire circular top from the center to the edge. V is going to vary from zero to two pi so that we get the entire circle traveling all the direction around. So U is controlling the radial arm and V is controlling the theta or angle arm. When we look at the top, U cosine V, U sine V three, it's almost identical. The only difference is in the third component where we have a three. Again, we will allow u to vary from zero to one, moving out along the radial arm. So we get the entire radius of the circular top. And then we'll vary v from zero to two pi so that we get the entire circle instead of just part of the circle. Now that we have the parameterizations, we need to find a normal vector to these surfaces. The way that we do that, of course, is to take the directional derivatives of each one which of course means holding one of the variables constant while the other varies. This gives us two tangent vectors that are tangent to the surface at a particular point. Then we take the cross product of the tangent vectors and that will give us a normal vector. Notice, however, that because these are so similar, when we take the partial derivative of each of these with respect to u, we're going to get exactly the same vector. Likewise, when we take the partial derivative with respect to V, we are also going to get exactly the same directional derivative. Because their directional derivatives are identical, we'll get the same formula for the normal vector. 
Go ahead and pause the video now to find each directional derivative on the top and bottom, prove that they're the same, and then find the cross product to get a normal vector formula for each of these surfaces. Then turn the video back on and we'll talk more about what our next steps are. Again, notice that when we take the partial derivative of the bottom with respect to u, we get cosine v sine v zero. When we take the partial derivative of the top in red with respect to u, we get exactly the same vector, cosine v comma sine v comma zero, because the partial derivative of three with respect to u is zero. When we take the partial derivatives with respect to v of both parameterizations, the top and the bottom, we get u sine v comma u cosine v comma zero. In other words, we're going to have the same formula for the normal vector. Go ahead and form the cross product uh, by finding the pseudo determinant of the three by three matrix. Crossing out column one gives us zero in the i hat direction. Crossing out column two also gives us zero in the j hat direction. Crossing out column three gives us u cosine squared of v minus a negative u sine squared v. We can factor out the u, which leaves cosine squared v plus sine squared v, which we know is a Pythagorean identity of one. This gives us a formula for a normal vector of zero comma zero comma u for the top and the bottom. Now, we're not quite done with this yet because we have to prove that this normal vector points out of our shape. Remember that our shape is a cylinder in many ways, much like a Coke can with a circular top and a circular bottom. We need the normal vector to point up out of the top and down out of the bottom. We'll take a closer look at that in just a moment. However, what we want to do next, now that we have at least a formula for the normal vector, is to go ahead and represent the vector field in terms of each parameterization. They're not exactly the same, so the representation of the vector field will be slightly different for each one. In order to find the representation of the vector field in each parameterization, I've recopied the parameterization for the bottom in blue and the top in red. What we need to do is represent the vector field with its three components in terms of each parameterization. The vector field has the first component P as X plus Y plus Z. That means that we substitute u cosine v for x, u sine v for y, and zero for z for the bottom. For the top, we would substitute u cosine v for x, u sine v for y, but three in place of z. The second component is y, and the third component is two x minus y. Because the x and the y are identical, on the two parameterizations, the only difference between the representation of the vector field for the bottom and the top will be whenever Z is used. Go ahead and work these out and then turn the video back on and we'll go on to determining whether or not the normal vector is indeed pointing out of our shape. I've gone ahead and written down the parameterization of the vector field, blue for the bottom and red for the top. Notice the only difference is in component one where the Z variable was present. The bottom does not have a constant as part of its first component, but the top has a plus three because Z was three for that parameterization. Now I need to determine whether or not that normal vector is actually pointing out. We want it to point in the positive orientation, which is either upward generally or out if it's a closed shape. 
Remember, a closed shape is something that completely encapsulates a solid. In this case, I went ahead and chose two points, one on the bottom surface and one on the top surface. The one I chose for the bottom surface was the point one zero zero. I have to look back at my parameterization to figure out what value of u and what value of v would produce one zero zero. When I look at that, I know that I want the cosine of v to turn out to be some non-zero value, but I need the sine of v to be zero. U can't be zero, or my first term would be zero, and I need it to be a one. If I choose V to be zero radians, then I can get cosine of V to be one and sine of V to be zero. Then I choose U to equal one to produce the point Z one zero zero. Now the normal vector was zero, zero, U. We'll have to determine whether or not zero, zero, one is pointing out of the bottom of this cylinder in this way, or if it's pointing up. Remember that if the normal vector points in the wrong direction, all we have to do is multiply through by a negative one, and that fixes it. For the top, I chose the point directly above it, but on the top surface where z equals three, one, zero, three. Likewise, I found that by choosing u to be one and v to be zero radians, I could get this value. Again, the normal vector formula that we found for both the top and the bottom was the vector zero comma zero comma u. Let's see if that's the case. When I plot 0, 0, u, I'm plotting 0, 0, 1, since u is 1 in both cases. In the case of the top, it does point out from that point out of the cylinder. However, on the bottom, you can see that it's pointing into the cylinder, which means that instead of using the normal vector 0, 0, u on the bottom, I need to use its opposite, 0, 0, negative u for the bottom surface. Let's go ahead now and write down the value of f of r1 of u and v dotted with r1u cross r1v. This is on the bottom, so we need to use 0, 0, negative u. And then also write down f of r2 of u and v dotted with r2u cross R2V, where on the top, we're allowed to use 0, 0, U. Write those down and compute the dot product, then turn the video back on so we can compare. When we enter or take the dot product of F of R1 dotted with R1U cross R1V, the first two components zero out since the normal vector is 0, 0, negative u for the bottom. This gives us negative 2u squared cosine v plus u squared sine v. Since the normal vector is the opposite, 0, 0, u for the top, we end up with the same value for f of r2 dotted with that normal vector but we get the opposite, 2u squared cosine v minus u squared sine v. These are opposites of one another or multiples of negative one. We can now use this in order to evaluate the surface integral, the flux on this vector field. We can do this by evaluating the double integral on the parameter domain how u and v vary using the dot product for the integrand. Since these are essentially the same with a negative one constant factor difference, we can integrate one of them to predict what the other will be as well. Go ahead and pause the video to work out one of these and turn it back on so we can compare our results. 
we now use negative 2u squared cosine v plus u squared sine v for the integrand of the double integral over the parameter domain. U represents the radius of the top and the bottom, so it varies from 0 to 1. V represents the angle, and we go all the way around, so it varies from 0 to 2 pi. I can factor out u squared as a common factor, and then I can integrate with respect to u squared to get u cubed over 3 multiplied by the constant factor sine v minus 2 cosine v. Evaluated between 0 and 1, u cubed over 3 gives me a one-third factor. When I integrate with respect to v, I get negative one-third cosine v between 0 and 2 pi minus two-thirds sine v between 0 and 2 pi. But since cosine at 0 and 2 pi is the same, the first term drops out. Likewise, sine at 0 and 2 pi is the same, so the second term drops out, which basically means that the net flux through the top and the bottom is zero. Let's see if we can see why it might be zero through the top and the bottom surfaces. When we look at the cylinder from the side, we can see that the flux into the top and out of the top is essentially the same. We have the same on the bottom as well, which explains why the net flux through the top and the bottom is zero. Let's go ahead now and take a look at the lateral sides. When we think about the side of the cylinder, notice that the radius does not vary on the side. On the side, the radius is always one. We'll not set one of our parameters to be the radius since it's constantly one. What does vary is the angle as we move all the way around. So one of our parameters will be the angle. We can represent the circle with cosine u and sine u, so the radius will be one. Notice that what also varies is the value of z, varying from zero to three. Therefore, we'll set our second parameter to be v. Let's go ahead and write down this parameterization now. We'll allow our parameter to be cosine of u, sine of u, comma, v. This will give us a circle of radius 1, since the coefficient of sine and cosine is 1, that will vary from u between 0 and 2 pi and v between 0 and 3, the values for z. Go ahead and compute the two directional derivatives, the partial of the parameterization with respect to u and with respect to v. Find their cross product to get a normal vector. Then represent the function, the vector field, in terms of the parameterization for the sides. Go ahead then and find the dot product of the normal vector with the parameterization of the vector field. Make sure first, however, that you take a point on the exterior of the cylinder and that it does point out of the shape. We could use either the point 103 or 100 since it's also on the sides. Go ahead and pause the video now to work this one out, then turn the video back on and we'll work it together. Our parameterization for the sides is cosine u, sine u, v, u varying from 0 to 2 pi and v from 0 to 3. The partial of the parameterization with respect to u is negative sine u, comma, cosine u, comma, 0. The partial derivative with respect to v is 0, comma, 0, comma, 1. When we find their cross product to get a normal vector, by marking out column one, we get cosine u in the i-hat direction. Marking out column two, 
gives us minus a negative sine u in the j hat direction or plus sine u in the j hat direction. Marking out column three gives us a zero for the two by two determinant. So our component of the normal vector for the third is zero. This gives us cosine u, sine u, zero for the normal vector. Let's make sure that it points out of the sides of the cylinder. I chose the point one, zero, zero for my point on the cylinder. Now let's look at the parameterization and determine what the value of u and v must be to give me the point one, zero, zero. I need the cosine of u to be one, but I need the sine of u to be zero. So I choose u to be zero radians. I need v to be zero, so I choose v equals zero. When I use the value u equals zero and v equals zero in the expression for the normal vector, I get the vector one, zero, zero. Let's take a look at what it looks like on our cylinder. When we look on the cylinder, the point one, zero, zero is here on the bottom where the bottom of the cylinder meets the sides. In this case, the vector one, zero, zero points directly along the X axis in the positive direction. Notice that it is red and pointing out of the cylinder. That means that it is in the positive or outward direction from the lateral sides of the cylinder. So I can go ahead and use the formula cosine u comma sine u comma zero for the normal vector. Then I'm going to use um, the parameterization of the vector field. Since the parameterization R of u and v is cosine u comma sine u comma v, then the vector field in the first component, x plus y plus z, becomes cosine u plus sine u plus v. The second component is y, which is sine of u. The third component is 2x minus y, which gives me 2 times cosine u minus sine of u. Now I need to take this parameterization of the vector field and dot it with my normal vector, cosine u, sine u, zero. When I find the dot product of those two vectors, I get the representation cosine u, sine u, plus v cosine u, plus one. Remember when you do a dot product to take the corresponding components, multiply them together, which requires the distributive property of cosine u over cosine u plus sine u plus v for the first component. The second component gives me sine squared of u, but the third component on the normal vector is zero, which gives me zero for the third part. Once I have the representation of their dot product, then I can go ahead and evaluate this in a double integral over the parameter domain. The parameter domain is the domain given by the restrictions on u and v. u again varies from zero to two pi, and v from zero to three. I chose to go ahead and integrate with respect to v first. v only appears in one of the three terms of the integrand. The other two will simply get a v when I integrate them since they're considered constants. In the middle term, v cosine u, I get v squared over two cosine u, and I evaluate all three from zero to three. This gives three cosine u sine u plus nine halves cosine u plus three for the integrand of the outer integral with respect to u from zero to two pi. For the first term, I did a u substitution, but I let w instead of u, since I've already used u, I let w be sine of u, then dw becomes cosine of u du. Then I solve, of course, for cosine u du, which I have in that term. 
Then I change the limits of integration. When u is zero, w is the sine of zero, which is zero. But when u equals two pi, the sine of two pi is also zero, which tells me that I would integrate from zero to zero, which tells me the first term zeros out when I integrate with respect to w. The next one is nine halves cosine of u. When I integrate that, I simply get sine of u multiplied by nine halves. When I integrate three, I get three u. I evaluate both between zero and two pi. Again, I find that that middle term is going to zero out since the sine of two pi is the same as the sine of zero. The only part that gives me any remaining flux is the third term, which gives me six pi. Six pi is what we got a long time ago when we computed it using the triple integral. In this way, we have demonstrated the divergence theorem that the triple integral over the solid of the divergence of the vector field is the same as the surface integral of the vector field. Let's talk about how we use the divergence theorem. As in Stokes' theorem, we're going to use the one that is simpler to compute. When you're looking at a solid that is easy to compute over, such as a rectangular parallelopiped or some other such shape, then you'll probably want to use the triple integral form. However, if the solid is something really nasty, then you may prefer instead to use a surface integral. Let's take a look at example two. In example two, we want to use the divergence theorem to calculate the flux integral f dot ds, where s is the boundary of the box or the surface of the box, given by x from zero to two, y from one to four, and z from zero to one where the vector field is given by x squared plus yz, comma y minus z, comma 2x plus 2y plus 2z. When we look at these figures, we can see two representations of this box. It is a rectangular parallelopiped, which is going to make integrating the triple integral very simple, since all the limits of integration will be constants. Go ahead and pause the video to work this one out by computing the triple integral of the divergence of the vector field, and then turn the video back on and we'll compare our answers. In this case, we first find the divergence since we know the solid is something we can easily evaluate in a triple integral. The divergence is del dot f, or the partial of p with respect to x, plus the partial of q with respect to y, plus the partial of r with respect to z. This gives me 2x for the partial of p with respect to x, plus 1 for the partial of q with respect to y, plus 2 for the partial of r with respect to z. This gives me the expression 2x plus 3. Then I go ahead and set up the triple integral. I'll integrate with respect to x first, since x is the only variable I have remaining in my integral. When I integrate 2x plus 3, I get x squared plus 3x. When evaluated from 0 to 2, 2 squared is 4, 3 times 2 gives me 6, and 4 plus 6 will give me 10. When I integrate the middle integral with respect to y, I get 10y evaluated from 1 to 4, which is a difference of 3 multiplied by 10, or 30 for the integrand when I integrate with respect to z. When I integrate with respect to z, I get 30z from 0 to 1, which gives me a final value of the flux of this vector field being 30. This is the amount of flow that we have coming through the surface S. Let's go ahead and take a look at example three. In example three, we're given a velocity vector field 
of v equal to x divided by z, comma, y divided by z, comma, zero. We're going to let c be the solid cube given by x between one and four, y between two and five, and z between one and four. Again, we have a solid that would be very easy to evaluate using a triple integral. We want to let S be the outside skin or boundary of this solid cube. We want to find the flow rate of the fluid across S. When we're looking for the flow rate, we're looking for the change in volume with respect to time. In this case, we don't use the density function, we simply take the vector field. Go ahead and pause the video to work this one out and then turn the video back on and we'll work it together. When we compute the divergence of this velocity vector field, we get the partial of P with respect to X of one divided by Z plus the partial of Q with respect to Y also of one divided by z, plus the partial of r with respect to z, but r is zero, so this gives us a plus zero. This gives us an integrand of two divided by z. We will integrate first with respect to z, since it's the only variable in our integrand, in this triple integral over a rectangular parallelopiped, otherwise known as a box. The integral of one over z dz is the natural log of the absolute value of z multiplied by the constant factor two. We evaluate between z equal one and four, noting that the natural log of one goes to zero. This gives us an integrand for the middle integral of two times the natural log of four. When we integrate with respect to y, we get two natural log of four multiplied by the variable y. y is evaluated from two to five, which gives us a constant factor of three, resulting in a new integrand for the outside integral of six natural log of four. When we integrate this constant with respect to x, we get x evaluated from one to four, which gives us another constant factor of three, giving us 18 times the natural log of four, for the total flux of the vector field. In this case, we are measuring the flow rate, the change in volume per unit of time. We have a couple of more ideas to talk about. And the first is going to be a sort of physical interpretation of what the divergence is giving us. We're gonna start with the three-dimensional vector field say given by p comma q comma r, which represents the velocity field of a fluid like the last example. We can interpret the divergence at a single point within the solid, E, as the net rate of outward flux of the fluid per unit volume, where the fluid flowing in is negative and the fluid flowing out is positive. To do this, we take a small ball of radius r about the point, and we measure the change in the flow rate between coming out positive and coming in negative. Then, of course, we add it up over all the points and allow the radius of the ball to go to zero. And this gives us our interpretation of the divergence, which turns out to be very similar to the flux. Let's now go ahead and talk about one more interesting consequence of the divergence theorem. Let's suppose that we have a piecewise smooth closed surface, which contains some solid shape, E. Let F be a vector field, which is defined on an open region containing the surface, S, and the solid inside of it. If F has the form where F is equal to, in the first component, a function of only Y and Z, but not X, and in the second component, a function of only X and Z, but not Y, 
and a function in the third component of only x and y, but not z, then when we find the divergence, it's going to be zero. Since the divergence is going to be zero, then we know that the flux or the surface integral of the vector field also has to be zero. This makes this type of flux integral incredibly easy to calculate. Let's take a look at a short example of one of these. In example four, we're asked to calculate the flux integral f dot ds, where the surface s is a cube of side length five centered at the origin. And f is given by cosine of z times e to the yz squared power, comma, x cubed minus 3xz, comma, sine of quantity x plus y multiplied by e to the tangent of x. This is a truly horrific vector field. If we wanted to use the surface integral form, we would have to parameterize all six sides of the cube. We would have to compute a normal vector for each six sides. We would have to rewrite the vector field in terms of the parameterization. This would be a nightmare problem to try to compute as a surface integral. However, if we notice, the first component does not contain the variable x. So the partial derivative with respect to x is zero. The second component does not contain y. So the partial derivative with respect to y is zero. And the third component does not contain z. So the partial derivative of r with respect to z is zero. That means the divergence of this vector field is zero. I don't even necessarily have to know what the solid is I'm computing it over. The integrand itself is zero. And that means that the value of the flux of the vector field is going to be zero. In essence, there's nothing I need to show. This is the end of the video series on multivariable calculus. There's nothing left for us to discuss. And I hope that you've learned a lot throughout this video series. You may want to recommend this to some of your friends and colleagues and see if they can likewise benefit from the video series. Thanks for watching.